So we're ready to resume now, and I'd like to invite the uh, panelists for our final panel. Hello. Welcome. And we're still waiting for Nasser. Is, is Nasser around or is, is he with you, Fatri? No, actually, um, Nasser, uh, he got a problem with the uh, charger of his. Uh, oh, that's, that's a shame. Yes. I, I don't know if he, he managed to solve it, but, um, uh, oh. you know, he, I don't know. He, 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 it looks he's got a problem. But he said he'll try to overcome it. Otherwise, you know. Okay. Well, if he joins us, he'll join us, and uh, and uh, then and we, we've got you um, and you cover some some similar ground. Great. So um, welcome to our um, panelists. Our our final panel for today is devoted to promoting disadvantaged languages. And what exactly are disadvantaged languages, and how are they disadvantaged? Is one of the things that we're going to discuss. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome as our panelists uh, Fatri Salem Abu Zakhar, who's the director of the um, uh, Libyan Amazigh Institute, um, Adam Shembri, who is professor of linguistics at the University of Birmingham and specialist in sign language, and Anastasia Dambovtseva, who is a, an educator, a uh, social media influencer and promoter of the Romani language um, from Ukraine, originally now based in Romania. Um, welcome. And uh, maybe we can start with you, um, Fatri. Um, people usually refer to your people and your language as the Berber. That's the name they're known by, but you call yourselves Amazigh and you call your language Tamazigh. Um, tell us a little bit, first of all, about your language. Where is it spoken? What is its status? And uh, and uh, is it written? And uh, what what, um, what what activities are covered in in, in the language? Um, and to, in what way is it disadvantaged? All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Aaron. And hi, everybody. Um, uh, well, when I was uh, assigned to 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 uh, to manage or to direct this uh, this this uh, center. I started thinking, you know, I tried to think, what, uh, what shall I do? What is my mission? And then I found that there is a big disadvantage with Tamazigh. Although Tamazigh language survived without, uh, you know, this issue of writing, you know, it's only uh, a uh, 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 spoken language, it's not written language. Although there is in, in, in Sahara, because Amazir, uh, for us, you know, uh, even if you see the, 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 the flag of Amazir is this um, uh, blue, which is, you know, uh, representing the, the Amazir on the coast, uh, the, uh, the green one, which is uh, represents the, the, the Amazir on the mountains. And uh, the, the yellow, which is uh, the Sahara or the, uh, the desert, Amazir in the desert, those, you know, they call themselves Tawar, or they call them Tawar. Actually, they don't call themselves Tawar. They call them, uh, themselves Imuhaq, Imuzar, Imushaq. It is like this. So uh, uh, Amazir are located on the coast, on mountains, in the desert. Um, however, uh, I mean, we don't write this language, and we, uh, it's not only that, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, this big disadvantage with our language that, uh, you know, the number of those uh, uh, speak the language, you know, it was decreasing, but thanks to technology, we think that there are these uh, revolutions of uh, information technology communication uh and human rights are helping you know with this issue so uh the slogan of our uh center is tamazir from oral to written language so this is the 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 uh, the disadvantage we we you know that it is not a written language so it, it, you know, to reserve all the heritage, all uh, 
التمازيغ وات هاز ان ان هيستوري ان بويتري ان وات ايفر يو نو اول اوف ذيس ريكوايرز ا ريزرفوار اور اور يو نو سمثينج تو 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 بروتكت ات اند مينتين ات سو So that, this that, is <laughs> thank you. We'll, we'll come back to to technology and to some of your specific activities um, in in a moment. Um, but it's interesting, first of all, to hear this association of uh, written language as a language that has more power. Uh, most languages in the world, of course, are not are not written. Uh, but we also know that many languages in the world are are endangered. Um, but technology is a new avenue, and and we'll we'll come back to technology uh, also in the others. Um, can we go over to you, um, Adam? Um, I think many of us uh, who are not directly immersed in, in sign language um, have become aware in recent years of its growing presence in the public domain. We see interpreters for sign language quite often in media, when politicians speak uh, at official conferences, um, and yet we live in a world that is very much dominated by, by spoken language. So maybe you can tell us, for those of us who, who don't know much about sign language, first of all, just in a couple of words, what, what is sign language? Is it one language or many different languages? Um, um, how does one learn? Where does one learn um, sign language? And, and, and what are some of the uh, obstacles facing um, uh, provisions uh, and the expansion uh, and learning of, of sign languages? Um, right. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks, Yaron. And thanks for the invitation to talk a little bit today about that. Um, currently, we don't actually know how many sign languages there are around the world. Um, we know that there are at least 200, um, uh, and uh, but we are discovering new ones all the time. I mean, um, for for example, Israel is particularly rich in sign languages. Uh, there's Israeli sign language, which is the dominant language. Um, uh, of the country, but there are about four Palestinian communities scattered across Israel where there are uh, what are called micro community sign languages. So sign languages that have developed in those communities because of a disproportionate number of deaf people in those communities. So, and two of these sign languages aren't very well documented. There's a, a project at the moment about to begin to work with two of those communities to document those languages properly. So we are discovering new sign languages all the time. Sign languages uh, are not spoken languages in sign form. So for example, I work on British Sign Language. Its vocabulary and grammar are not the same as English. Okay, there's a lot of English influence, obviously, but uh, the grammar of the language uh, has its own sentence structure, for example. There are particular grammatical phenomena that are unique to sign languages. Um, the vocabulary isn't a one-to-one -one match. There's not a sign for every word. Some signs have multiple meanings, multiple translations in English. Some signs translate entire sentences in English. In a, in a single sign. So it's just what you would expect. It's no different from moving from one spoken language to another. The vocabularies, the grammars are not the same. Um, so when you see an interpreter interpreting, for example, the prime minister, although there wasn't very much interpretation of the prime minister during the COVID period, there was um, interpreters provided by the Welsh first ministers and the first minister in Scotland, but there was a campaign actually to get um, uh, Boris Johnson, for example, to stand up with an interpreter. That was unsuccessful. Um, but when you see a BSL, a British Sign Language interpreter working, what they are doing is interpreting. They are taking the English message and interpreting that into British Sign Language, choosing the vocabulary, choosing the grammar that best matches the meaning of those. So they're not actually putting spoken English into signed form. Um, the big disadvantage, as you can imagine, as you've kind of preempted, uh, Yaron, by asking these questions, is that uh, m most people around the world don't know these basic facts about sign languages. They don't know that they're actual languages, that they're separate from spoken languages. And the big disadvantage on you know, Mother Language Day is that actually sign languages are the only fully accessible languages for deaf children, but they're most often not the language of their mother or their father, or their parents, or caregiver. So in the adult deaf community in Britain, for example, about 95% of deaf people are born to hearing parents. About 5% are 
are born to deaf parents because of uh, the genes for deafness running in families. And they're the lucky ones because they get exposure to British Sign Language from birth. And we know that they go on to do very well educationally and they go on to acquire English more successfully than the deaf people from hearing families because those hearing families have to learn an additional language. And there's very little support for parents of deaf children to access sign language instruction. Um, uh, and so often many uh, deaf people don't, their parents do not learn to sign. So it's a very common experience that the, the mother language of the, of the deaf community is not actually the language of their mothers or their parents or their caregivers at all. So uh, in response to this, the World Federation of the Deaf last year created a declaration on the rights of deaf children. And that is a declaration that all deaf children should have access to uh, their natural mother tongues, which mother languages, which are sign languages of their local deaf communities. But getting governments to recognize that across the world is a huge task, um, especially because we need to support the families to learn these languages. We need to ensure that one of the big problems that, that uh, sign languages get is that many, even today, many medical professionals who are often the first people to see deaf children, to diagnose deaf children, mistakenly believe that exposing children to sign languages will disadvantage their acquisition of a spoken language and a written language. And actually we know the reverse is true, but getting that message out to uh, the medical profession is a constant struggle. Right. Okay, well, th thank you for this introduction. It, it, it's very interesting. We, we tend to think of sign language, of course, as associated with a disability. Uh, but in fact, what you've said is that, um, the, at least numerically, that there is it's an issue of multilingualism, yes. uh, in fact, and, and how do we communicate um, across uh, languages and, and, and the need to, to promote multilingualism. Uh, we're getting here and there um, some questions, in, uh, so I'll just remind you again that um, you can use the Q&A for questions and we'll come back to your questions. But first, I'd like to go to Anastasia. Um, and uh, you're working with Romani, and Romani, as many people will know, uh, is a, a rather unique uh, language in Europe in terms of its history and its distribution. It's a non-territorial language, so it's spoken uh, everywhere as a language minority, virtually all, all around Europe and beyond. Um, all of its speakers are bilingual or multilingual. Um, the multilingualism is always unidirectional. Romani people learn the languages that surround them. Very few people uh, learn uh, the uh, Romani language if they're not um, raised uh, in the Romani community. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, unique in its history. It's an Indo-Aryan language, so related to the modern languages of India that came to Europe uh, at, at some point around the, the 10th century or so, just to, to put a bit of history. But how did you become interested um, in uh, Romani? What was your encounter and what, what prompted you to, to get involved in, in the promotion of the Romani language? Uh, hello everyone, thank you for the introduction and for having me. Uh, so uh, actually, you know, um, when uh, I just uh, started thinking about studying new languages, uh, I um, was thinking about, uh, I would like to uh, learn a uh, new language, uh, but I'd like to do it not for business, but uh, to uh, do it like for social useful uh, activities. And I start thinking uh, which language it could be in my area, because uh, uh, that time, so I was born in Kyiv and uh, in Ukraine, in the capital in Kyiv, and I start thinking about my city, uh, what uh, language it could be. And uh, I uh, I don't know why, but uh, yeah, I uh, ended up with the uh, Romani. Uh, but that time I didn't think uh, about this language like uh, um, disadvantaged, disadvantaged language or um, endangered language. Uh, actually, I was thinking about people and uh, I uh, saw that there is a need uh, to uh, teach uh, these people uh, literacy in their uh, mother tongue. So uh, it was uh, my idea, and uh, I um, um, that it uh, that it was my uh, 
decision, yeah, it was based not uh, to um, save the language. Uh, you know, even I didn't know that this language uh, is uh, endangered. Uh, I uh, just know that a lot of Roma children um, don't go to school. And uh, that was my point why I started learning this language. OK, so we'll, we'll come back to some of your activities in, in a moment. Uh, um, and I'm interested particularly in the technology uh, aspect. But uh, first, uh, Fatha, you, you asked, you raised the issue of technology. Can you tell us a little bit, is technology um, helping um, your people and speakers of, of, of various Tamazight and related languages uh, to embrace their language? I, I once um, had uh, uh, a uh, uh, the privilege to, to attend a, a meeting of uh, some of your people that your, your brother um, um, Nasser invited me to in Manchester and uh, some of the young people were telling me that they actually attend the Libyan school in Arabic um, but when they send text messages to one another they write in their mother and father tongue Tamazigh but they use Arabic alphabet so these are young people growing up in England using the Arabic alphabet to write their language um, when text messaging. So, so how is technology um, um, supporting the, the language and, and are people embracing it um, to, to use the language? You need to uh, unmute your, yourself, uh, Fatri. You need to open your microphone. I forgot. Yes, I forgot. Uh, pardon me. Uh, well, I mean, the question is, is really, um, it's a big question, I would say, because uh, the, the issue of technology, uh, I mean, you could look at it from the point of view of communication with Amazigh, especially during the era of dictatorship. I mean, we couldn't communicate, we couldn't uh, see uh, how uh, the language is progressing, uh, how, what is happening with the issue of, of Tamazigh. But with the with the internet, with the uh, with the communication uh, system uh, technology, so uh, that give access to Amazigh all over the world, they can communicate. That is one uh, issue. Also, uh, I mean uh, the, 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 the 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 issue. Uh, I will come back uh, later. But uh, the, I mean. Uh, uh, Amaz uh, Tamazigh language faced an issue of what to choose, how to write it, to choose uh, with, uh, the, the, Lat the Latin uh, alphabets, the uh, Arabic alphabets, or the Tifinagh, which is the origin, uh, the, 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 I mean, in, 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 in North Africa. In North Africa, I mean, we had the, the actually um, a kind of a workshop uh, at the center because we we had two supporters. Some they support, uh, they say, no, we want uh, Agmai, which is uh, uh, the, the, you know the, these alphabets in, 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 in the uh, say Latin, you know, Latin. Or 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 the or the or the, the tifinag. Actually, even the issue of of tifinag or or using the 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 uh, the uh, Latin alphabet. So uh, these are two schools, you know, that 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 really there is a, a kind of uh, you know um, dispute uh, about this. So we uh, end up with the result that tifinag are our heritage because we found it in the uh, tattoos in uh, in 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 uh, in the the, the uh, kind of dresses you know we have and uh, uh, you find it uh, written on 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 rocks uh, I, I mean as signs especially in, in in the desert to show where you could find what uh, the wells and uh, you know uh, direction uh, so 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 that is our heritage and that is we we uh, uh, we give it the first choice. However, there is a big, uh, I mean, uh, uh, writings in 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 in, in Agam, Agamai, uh, and that requires uh, we we don't want to lose it. So 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 for a researcher has to know both, but for uh, uh, to teach as a language we we teach uh, with Tifina. 
coming back to, to, to technology, technology, we, we, we think it, it is very important for us, especially uh, we are scattered and uh, to, to uh, like the center now we have a project to, 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 to train trainees. So, so, so what we will, will do, we will use uh, uh, this uh, remote, uh, uh, you know, uh, technology to, 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 uh, to, to, to get in touch with, with those and, and train them to be trainees in their hometowns. We will invite them for, for one day in, in Tripoli, but then they will go to their, uh, to, to their uh, cities and we will, uh, and this uh, uh, trainer or this uh, lecturer will be uh, uh, lecturing them from here, from Tripoli and there. So this is one of the projects. So the, the technology can help a lot, applications. Uh, we've seen a lot of applications that uh, you know helps you to 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 to, to learn how uh, how to write and how to speak a few words. So 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 technology can can do a lot. Does does um, Tamazi have a, an established standard orthography, or is there variation among the different varieties? Uh, well, I mean, in writing, in writing. More or less, I mean, it is one, but but of course, I mean, we're having a problem with the standardization of, of the language because different, we have different varieties in, in, in every country, in Libya, in Algeria, in uh, Morocco, in Tunisia. So, so, so th there is no one uh, standard language, but we believe that to reach standardization, we have to, to, to start with the variants and to start with the grammar, with the grammar with each 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 variant and we document that in in we try actually in in, in the center now we have a few uh we have a few books in 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 in, in this issue thank you um i'm one of the interesting the several things uh, in common for our three case studies um on, on this panel uh and one of them is is the fact that they are dispersed uh non non-territorial they're spoken by different communities in different places and obviously the the mobility uh, and the connectivity is is an important um, uh, issue. Um, um, Adam, I, I understand that uh, obviously that there isn't really a, a written form as such for sign language, although there are there are ways of representing it um, in in for academic study purposes, for example. So so I, I imagine that um, technologies like the one that we're using just now, uh, the remote video, uh, um, have been revolutionary in in uh, connecting people. Um, I also recall um, uh, an encounter um, when we, we did some work with Manchester Deaf Center some, some years ago, um, and one of the priorities for them in terms of provisions were that um, public service providers should have um, proper uh, internet um, facilities to uh, allow interpreting, um, visual interpreting um, um, online. Um, what, what role do um, technologies play both in the documentation and, and the promotion? Um, and there was also a question here in the chat um, on whether uh, there is any lexical statistical research on, on sign language. So maybe you can address both uh, those issues and then we'll go over to Anastasia and maybe see some uh, examples of, of using Romani uh, online uh, in social media in a moment. But Adam, first you. Um, yes, I mean, social media has revolutionized the way deaf people can communicate because obviously you no longer have to be face to face. You see a lot of deaf people using uploading and sharing videos uh, in BSL on Facebook groups or sharing it uh, via other you know, social media platforms. So that has really revolutionized things. Also, the rise of digital video itself has helped enormously with documentation projects. So um, uh, uh, I have been working, for example, with the team at University College London on the creation of a British Sign Language corpus. So we have filmed 249 deaf people all over the UK, including 30 people in the Manchester Deaf Centre. Um, uh, and uh, we have put a lot of the films uh, from these like personal we put uh, we've shared their personal experience narratives and things like that online you can so if you google bsl corpus project you can see some of the data that we collected so it's it's not only helped with communication but also enormously with with documentation um in terms of the lexico statistical research um yes some work has been done so you may have noticed 
for example, that I have an Australian accent. And that's because we know that British Sign Language, there is a family of sign languages historically related to British Sign Language, um, which include Australian Sign Language and New Zealand Sign Language. So literally deaf people from the UK took BSL with them when they moved out to the colonies in Australia and New Zealand. And so we have varieties there that have emerged. Similarly, there's a family in East Asia. So the Japanese established schools for deaf children in Korea and Taiwan. So even today, Taiwanese sign language, Korean sign language and Japanese sign language are historically related. They share may, many lexical items. Um, in North Africa, for example, LS, LSR, sign, uh, Algerian sign language, not surprisingly, is historically related to LSF, Langue des Signes Française, French sign language, okay. Israeli sign language is historically related to German sign language because many people uh, moved to Israel in the 1930s from Germany and they took a German sign language with them. So there are definitely historical patterns, but many, many sign languages are language isolates. They've emerged spontaneously within communities. So many of them are, are also language isolates. So that's that creates challenges for language documentation and, and research as well. So Anastasia, much of your work um, is uh, around social media, and I, I've seen some some samples, and, and they were quite amazing. Tell us a little bit about that, how you got involved with social media, what you do, what the reactions have been, uh, and if we can, and, and hopefully it'll work, um, technically, show us a couple of examples, okay? Okay, thank you. It was a pleasure. I will share some examples. And yeah, uh, I also would like to say that the uh, modern social um, network uh, helps a lot to promote uh, uh, languages, to promote literacy, and uh, uh, actually uh, it um, uh, helps to reach people very quickly. And uh, uh, even uh, uh, you uh, don't have to uh, search people because they <laughs> uh, can find you, <laughs> yeah, actually. And uh, um, uh, how it started, uh, I just, uh, I had some volunteer uh, classes with uh, Romani uh, children, but uh, it was, um, I could uh, um, teach five or uh, seven people, uh, children, It um, I don't have opportunity to teach a lot, but of course, uh, personally, I knew much more uh, people, uh, children who wanted to uh, learn to read and write. And then I see that uh, in uh, my country and in other countries there are a lot of people who uh, don't have opportunity to attend schools but they want to uh, uh, to know how to read and i thought perhaps uh, i could uh, record videos short videos post them on a popular social network and uh, uh, first of all it was lessons for my students and i also think uh, perhaps someone who doesn't know me but uh, who is interested in this education they could uh, teach uh, themselves and uh, i uh, used tiktok platform and uh, yeah it's uh, that is how my blog <laughs> started yeah and uh, uh, yeah and now um, i would like to share with you one um, as for me, it's quite um, outstanding case uh, because uh, one of the um, kind of sort of video which I post, it's like a video vocabulary. And uh, uh, it's uh, quite interesting because uh, some of this video became uh, viral because uh, people uh, started uh, uh, making duets with uh, me. And uh, for example, they want, wanted to like, uh, you know, to um improve my uh, Romani because they think that uh, I speak not uh, uh, correct <laughs> uh, but uh, the point is that they just speak another dialect and uh, it's quite interesting and uh, I try to share with you my screen right now I hope uh, no sorry I perhaps I um have to yes switch on the sound yeah um can you see my screen 
No, it's it's yeah, we can. Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, from the um, TikTok. And uh, for example, this video, it was um, uh, very interesting. For example, yeah, fruit in Romani. And uh, we could see that. Uh, Um, Abai, Berry, yeah. Mura, Pea, Ambrol, Fruit in the Vlach dialect of Romani, Apple, mm -hmm. Abai, Berry, Mura, Vegetables in, no, I, I fruit know. in the Vlach okay. dialect of Romani. Apple, Pabai, mm. Berry, Mura. Ah, yes, here I see. I see. Um, as you can see uh, here, uh, this uh, is the amount of uh, duets. Yeah, so the uh, people uh, um, took uh, my video and they started uh, creating uh, some um, duets <laughs> with this and they uh, explain how they say this uh, um, fruits in their dialects. Or, uh, for example, uh, it was fruit in the Vlach dialect of Romani. Apple. <clears throat> I would like to show you one duet. Uh, it's also about food. Mm. Food in the Vlach dialect of Romani. This one. Food in the Vlach dialect of Romani. Hi, Trikas. Food. Hamos. Hamos, da. Bread. Marno. Perfecto. Milk. Food. Yeah, with. Water. Pipai. Pare na pipai. Chayo. Chayo, chayo. Butter. Tzil. Kile. Oil. Besuki. Zeto. Ulei she. Porridge. Porridge. Kurmi. Kurmi. Gurmi. Soup. Kile porridge? Zumi. Zumi. Naive shorba, naive shorba de burta. Zumi porridge, chayo, chayo, chayo. Pendejo. Akur, una pendejo, pendejo, maricón de Macho. Macho. No, macho. Meat. Mas. Mas. Bravo. Cheese. Tiral. Kral. 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 Parnoro. So. Uh, okay. is... We got we got the idea. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's something like example. So, and I think that uh, so I would like to stop the sharing. Yeah, it's OK now. Yes, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I also think that in this case, it's not only like uh, educational, it's also so uh, the target audience uh, helps to promote the language in this way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's wonderful. And that that's a real kind of community work. And we, we heard earlier today about communities um, uh, and how and the pluralism is is there and it's inherent to it. And it's all mediated um, um, across different locations uh, through the um, through the uh, media of, of technology. Uh, a question that that um, was was posted here is is um, in relation to standardization. It, you know, if we have online technology of this kind and people can interact and comment on each other's variants, uh, isn't standardization really a, a a thing of the past? Do we still need? Uh, standardization, um, and uh, I think uh, partly um, Fatri addressed the question as a matter also of, of identity, putting your language forward and getting forward recognition might involve a, a project of, of standardization and raising confidence. Uh, but in terms of practical communication, the technologies uh, and the, the uh, embracing of, of, of pluralistic repertoires allows people to communicate across different variants. Um, so uh, I, I want to bring things to a close um, and ask each of you with, with just one short um, sentence um, to maybe conclude with a, a statement about uh, what, what is the ambition for the future uh, for the language that you're involved in, that you represent? What, what do you think are the main things that could be, needs to be achieved and, and where do you see uh, yourselves contributing um, um, to them? Fatri, please, first. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, uh, for us, we need uh, in Libya to legitimize, you know, the, 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 the language, because without any legal protection, it can be at any time, you know, a decision can be made to stop speaking this language. Unfortunately, uh, recently, they refused to give a name to a school, Tusna, Tusna, which means knowledge in, in, in Tamazight. The, it was refused and it created a big problem. So without constitu uh, constitu uh, putting it in the, in, in the constitution and legalize it, you know, it, it, uh, you know, we, 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 we can't know, we can't guarantee what will be the future. But hopefully things will go well. <laughs> okay, thank you, Adam. Um, recently, the, uh, the government in England um, uh, agreed to make uh, a BSL, a British Sign Language <laughs> curriculum for the GCSE. Um, so for the secondary, uh, to make it a secondary school subject. Um, one of the issues that we need uh, in order to support that is the training of teachers, but also particularly documenting the language and creating resources. I mean, I see my role as a linguist to, to work with the community to assist in that kind of process. But I'm also, um, you know, uh, a member of the uh, Global Coalition for Language Rights. Um, so, and I encourage people here to to look up the Global Coalition for Language Rights and and have a look at the kind of work that they're doing, because I think also being an advocate for the language rights of deaf communities is extremely important. Raising awareness of that uh, right uh, that deaf children have to their mother language on Mother Language Day, like today, is extremely important. Uh, obviously, I'm not deaf myself, so that role is something I see, you know, I work at, with deaf communities and deaf organizations to achieve those kinds of goals. Yeah, well, thank you for, for mentioning the Global Coalition for, for Language Rights, uh, certainly a, a broad and, and international network. Um, and there's been some discussion in, in recent years among um, specialists and activists about what's the best approach to language rights. Do we um, wait for them to be legislated and then go through the whole tedious process of claiming the rights uh, for implementation, or do we just go ahead under the banner of what some people have called linguistic citizenship and just do things uh, on, on the ground? Um, but I think that tension will remain and, and the two are, are complementary as, as we're, we're hearing. Um, Anastasia, there's been a, a question to you whether TikTok is your main platform or whether you have others. Uh, so maybe you can address that and, and also tell us what, what are your plans and the ambition and the agenda for the for the near future. Yeah, my uh, ambition is uh, a very good, uh, high developed online education in Romania. I'd like to say in this way. Well, no more, no less. <laughs> That's an <laughs> absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> My focus is uh, uh, digitalization, online education. Yeah. Right. Well, that's that's fantastic, and and uh, um, hopefully um, we can continue to collaborate a little bit. I also have an interest in Romania uh, of of uh, since uh, of many years, and uh, and some collaborators and and some new exciting collaborators that I've been teaming up with in in, in recent weeks and, and hopefully we can do something uh, together and, and, and certainly um, uh, look into that uh, fascinating network of uh, of, of broadcasts and, and, and interactive um, um, forums uh, that, that you've created. Um, I'd like to um, thank uh, everyone, uh, our panelists uh, for this panel and uh, those in the previous two panels. It's been a really, really wonderful event and thanking all our participants who've um, endured through several hours. It's not every day that we have this kind of a, of a format. Um, again, based in Manchester, hosted by Manchester groups as part of the uh, annual Manchester uh, program from International Mother Language Day, but with international outreach, both our panelists and uh, most of our participants um, from um, international. I'd like to um, thank uh, Emmanuel Labo, director of the Aston Center for Applied Linguistics, 
uh, for the uh, technical facilitation and much of the organizational effort um, leading uh, to this event. I'd like to also thank uh, two of our co-founders on City of Languages who aren't with us today, but have contributed uh, to this event, Kesra Shawraz, whose idea it was uh, to have a conference in this kind of forum with several panels, uh, and Becky Swain, uh, director of Manchester Poetry uh, Library, uh, who came up with the, the theme and, and part of the title um, as well. Um, the utopia, remember, is something that is yet to be achieved, uh, and it seems that we're all working towards that in, in different ways. Um, so, um, thank you very much again and uh, have a good evening. Keep up the excellent good work. Uh, look us up if you wish on uh, the uh, Manchester City of Languages website, Global Coalition for Language Rights, um, other many initiatives uh, that are around the social media platforms, the institutes, um, and uh, continue networking um, to make the world uh, a better place and uh, enjoy and uh, be creative with all of our linguistic skills and resources. Thank you. Have a good evening. Good night.